Any app that asks the user to enter data usually works better when it stores the data it was given. But this is easier said than done when working with Apple's frameworks. In our app, we're using MK Point Annotation to store interesting places the user wants to visit, and we'd like to use the iOS storage to save it permanently. So, create a new Swift file called mkpointannotation-codable.swift. Add an import for MapKit, then give it this code. Extension MK Point Annotation conforms to Codable. Public required init from decoder, decoder, throws. Then public func encode to, encoder, encoder, throws. That's a custom conformance to Codable, but it doesn't do anything. However, it already doesn't work. If you try building, you'll see the error. Required initializer must be declared directly in class MK point annotation, not in an extension. Let me get right to the point. There is no way of making that code work in Swift. It's not required that you understand why this is impossible, but I do think it sheds some light on how Swift works. MK point annotation isn't a final class, which means other classes can inherit from it. We might be able to implement codable conformance for this one class, but in doing so, we're also saying that all subclasses should also be codable, and that's not a promise we can keep. There are a few solutions to this. First, MK point annotation is a class that implements the MK annotation protocol, so we could just create our own class that conforms to the same protocol. Second, we could create a subclass of MK point annotation and implement codable there effectively shielding the MK point annotation from any knowledge that Codable is being used. This is now our class, so we can force subclasses to conform to Codable. And third, we could create a wrapper struct around the class, making the struct conform to Codable and store an MK point annotation internally. All three of those are good options, and you can easily make a case that any of them are the right option here. However, the easiest option is a subclass, because we can implement it in a single file, then change only two places where MK point annotation is used to make it work with the rest of our code. First, the code. We're going to create a new class called Codable MK point annotation that inherits from MK point annotation and conforms to Codable. We do need to provide a custom Codable implementation so that all our data gets saved, and that's mostly straightforward. The only wrinkle is that CL location coordinate 2D doesn't already conform to Codable, so we'll save it as latitude and longitude. Other than that, there's nothing special here. So replace whatever you have in MK point annotation codable.swift with this. Class codable MK point annotation inherits from MK point annotation conforms to codable. Enum coding keys conforms to coding key. Case title, subtitle, latitude, longitude. Override init, what is called super init. Then public required init from decoder decoder, throws, again super.init, but then we'll ask our decoder for a container keyed by coding keys.self and use that to read a string out for the title and another string for the subtitle. For the latitude, we'll use CL location degrees, which is actually just a type alias for double. And the same for longitude. Then use those two values to make a CL location coordinate 2D. Then public func encode to encoder, encoder throws. We'll make another container keyed by coding keys. And we'll encode title. Subtitle, coordinate latitude, and coordinate longitude. The MK point annotation class is used in several places around our project, but we only have to change it in two places. First, change the location property and content view to this array of codable MK point annotation. And now change the action of the plus button in content view so that new location also uses our subclass. Let new location equals codable MK point annotation. We don't have to change the other places because codable MK point annotation is a subclass of MK point annotation, which means any place we use an MK point annotation, 
we can send in a codable MK point annotation. This is technically known as behavioral subtyping, but you'll more commonly hear it called the Liskov substitution principle after its creator Barbara Liskov. If you've ever heard the term solid, this is the L. Anyway, where things get interesting is how we load and save the data. Because this time, we're not going to use user defaults. Instead, we're going to write our JSON to the iOS file system, so we can write as much data as we need. Previously, I showed you how to find our app's documents directory. So start by adding this method to content view. Func get documents directory returns a URL. Let parts equals file manager dot default dot URLs for dot document directory in dot user domain mask. Then return path zero. With that in place, we can now use get documents directory dot appending path component to create new URLs that point to a specific file in the documents directory. Once we have that. It's as simple as using data, contents of, and JSON decoder to load our data, both things we've used before. So add this load data method to content view. Func load data. Let file name equals get documents directory dot appending path component save places. Do let data equals try data contents of file name. Locations equals try JSON decoder dot decode an array of codable MK point annotation dot self from data. Then catch print unable to load save data. Using this approach, we can write any amount of data in any number of files. It's much more flexible than user defaults. And if we need it, also allows us to load and save data as needed, rather than immediately when the app launches as with user defaults. However, another great benefit of this approach is the way we write stuff. Sure. We're going to use the same get documents directory and JSON encoded dance to get our data ready. But this time we're going to use the write to method to save the data to disk, writing to a particular URL. Previously, I showed you this method with strings, but the data version's even better because it lets us do something quite amazing in just one line of code. We can ask iOS to ensure the files written with encryption so it can only be read once the user has unlocked the device. This is in addition to requesting atomic writes. iOS does almost all the work for us. So add this method to content view now. Func save data. Do let file name equals get documents directory dot appending path components save places. Let data equals try JSON encoder dot encode self dot locations and try data dot write to file name options under array of dot atomic write and dot complete file protection. We'll do a catch block, print unable to save data. Yes, all it takes to ensure the file store with strong encryption is to add dot complete file protection to the data writing options. After all that work, the last thing we have to do is actually connect those methods up to Swift UI. So everything gets automatically loaded and saved. For loading data, we just have to add an on appear modifier to the Z stack in content view. Dot on appear, perform, load data. For saving, we can use the same on dismiss parameter for sheet that was introduced back in project 13. This means we can save the data every time edit view is dismissed, which means we save new items as well as edited items. So change the sheet modifier in content view to this. On dismiss, save data. Go ahead and run the app now, and you should find you can add items freely. Then relaunch the app to see them restored just as they were. That took quite a bit of code in total, but the end result is that we have loading and saving done really well. The codable conformance is all isolated in one file, so SwiftUI doesn't have to care about it. When we write data, we're making iOS encrypt it so the file can't be read or written until the user unlocks their device. And the load and save process is almost transparent. We added one modifier and changed another. And that's all it took. Of course, our app isn't truly secure yet. We've ensured our data file is saved out using encryption, so it can only be read once the device has been unlocked. But there's nothing stopping someone from reading the data afterwards.